Some people have referred to what they call the greening of the First World War, which is a very interesting motif. And of course, um, that can, that's a difficult one for, for unionism to take on board. But I think it's a good thing to take on board because if unionism is going to become more um, sophisticated and able to deal with uh, the 21st century world, it has to embrace more complicated narratives. Well, um, from my background coming from within, though not always entirely uh, sharing all the views of the unionist community, um, the First World War dominated my perception of 1916, I think. Um, I had done a lot of work um, interviewing old men who'd been soldiers. And so I'm really fascinated by not only that story, but how that story gets told. I'm increasingly interested in how stories get told, what they, how they matter to cultures and communities and how the stories change and make impact on society. But the big opportunity this year was to look at the Easter Rising more closely. And I found that really uh, very interesting. So for me, 1916 has in some measure been about discovery. So for example, um, I was asked to do a talk at the Spring Fedia here in West Belfast. And I decided to choose three characters that relate at some level to 1916. One, obviously, Roger Caseman. Another, um, though he kind of steps to the side by 1916, but he's involved in the Irish Citizen Army formation, and that's Captain Jack White. And then the third person was Bulmer Hobson, obviously a key Republican figure, all from Protestant backgrounds. And in my talk, which was a fruit of a fair bit of work on it and a fair bit of basic secondary source research, but some primary source as well, in the case of Hobson, um, to try to discomfort a little bit some of the um, perhaps traditional falsehood perception of these figures, uh, and also then to challenge uh, unionists as well. So what I mean by that is to take the case of Roger Casement, to look at the way in which uh, this man, he's kind of orphaned and thrown on the world at the age of 16, a very diverse range of backgrounds and, and, and experiences, but he, he's involved with the Baptist Missionary Association. He, you know, when he forms the, um, or helps to generate and eventually form the Congo Reform Association, he's collaborating with evangelical ministers, uh, clergy, it's a part of that whole story. He talk, um, Some of the Baptist uh, leaders talk about him coming to Christ, which is the code phrase for an evangelical experience. So presenting that, uh, I'm presenting uh, also the way in which Jack White has this, uh, what should we say, lurid and strange and complex background, you know, um, staying in a commune influenced a bit by Tolstoy, but also much more libertarian seemingly. Though you have to question sometimes exactly what he tells you in his autobiography. But nonetheless, here's a, a complex man. So he returns to Ireland, but his motives for coming back and the experiences he's had just before it are much a long distance away from what one might expect from someone who joins in with James Connolly. So um, likewise, some research into Hobbes was fascinating. I went to a Quaker school, taught in a Quaker school in Lisburn that he would have attended for three years back at the end of the 19th century. So in a way, um, bringing up the ghosts of Roger Casement and Bulmer Hobson into grammar school, Protestant, middle-class, educated <laughs> North is a very profitable thing because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's discomforting in a good kind of way to think about the, you know, the, the nature of what it is to be Irish Protestant. Uh, what that inheritance might be. But also, you know, I think it was a surprise perhaps on the Falls Road for me to, to talk about these characters in a slightly more iconoclastic way, I think. So, in um, a few sentences, <laughs> 1916 for me has been very exciting because it's opened up that period of history and particularly the Easter Rising in a very fresh and interesting way. I mean, I also want to say that I went down and did talk uh, on the 
I can't remember the exact day, but it was a big day in Dublin in April. Was it April? Yeah. Um, I came down. There was 100 talks for 100 years. And I was asked to do a talk on, uh, well, a subject of my choice. And I chose two British soldiers from the north here who had been shot dead in during the Rising. One in Lower Gardner Street, the other um, the chap in a slightly different location in North Inner City, Dublin. So I did that talk and I was invited to do it. And we did it in um, DIT. Um, and what was then very interesting when doing the research, I mean, to discover, for example, that one of those chaps is buried in a cemetery in Grey Abbey. But in that cemetery, just a few metres away, is buried a United Irish clergyman, James Porter. I have also got an ancestor, by the way, who was a United Irish clergyman hanged further down the peninsula at Kirkcubbin. So I was very interested in that. But in a way, you know, I was talking very predictably about, about British soldiers in the Easter Rising, and it was very important to do that. And there's been a great resurgence of interest in that all across Ireland, I think, and an ability to reclaim that story um, as being part of the tragedy always involved in something like a, a, an insurrection. But also to, to, to see, you know, uh, uh, look down the layers of history and see, you know, as Seamus Heaney said, you know, in Bogland, every, you know, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, every layer has been camped on before. You know, there are all those layers of history everywhere we, we, we go and they tell us interesting and sometimes surprising stories. So those are the sort of things that have been um, to do with 1916 for me. And just the experience of being in Dublin that weekend was very good. I thought it was a very warm experience. Um, very often Dublin's very crowded with tourists, but you got the feeling it was crowded with families out for the day and a kind of reclamation of, you know, um, a historical event that was positive, you know. And we have worried about commemoration, especially here in Belfast, worried a lot about it. My experience of 1916 would indicate to me, I think, that we can do this quite safely. So this year, I wrote a play and produced it with a couple of actors here called Halfway House. And the play is set in the year 1966, 50th anniversary of the Rising, so perhaps a slightly over-obvious title. But um, the, the title has several meanings, and though it's the name of a pub where these two women actually meet in the spring of 1966, and one has a father who's going to parade at Easter time at Balmoral for the 50th anniversary of the song, and the other, after a bit of probing, uh, relates to the reality that she has a medal belonging to her father who was in Easter 1916. So they're in a pub, it's a snowy night on the Sparrows, they, they, they can't go anywhere and they're forced to talk by the fire. Um, you've only so many plots available to you in literature, right? But um, we did that play, we did it around a variety of venues. So it was a way of trying to look at 1916 refracted through the experience of 66, because you never look at the past. I think that's one thing I've learned. You never look at the past as through a window. You look, it, it comes to you through a prism. And uh, so that was the, the, the purpose of that. And always um, after the show, we had discussion and debate. And Depart uh, Department of Foreign Affairs are going to provide, or have provided more money to do this again in September. We're going to be performing it again. So 1916 for me has also been about thinking about how the past comes to us, you know, um, how the past is mediated to us in 1966 and what comes after in 69. So very, very important. Yeah. It's become a much safer space for both for talking about all of these things um, and exploring them and then also to use public space safely in Dublin to, to, to celebrate to a degree. Um, but public space here was always going to be a worrying thing. The big worry for me um, and for the community I work a lot with would be that those big civic spaces at the heart of Belfast would become a site for a big um, 1916 commemoration. Now, the problem with that is, though in an era of shared space, I guess, there has to be uh, an opening out 
to do that. But the problem is that the centre of Belfast isn't just a neutral space for unionists, because the City Hall is a sacred building, you know, a, a gleaming new building in which in 1912, September 28th, the Ulster Covenant is signed with this loaded extra dimension of the uh, the, the Senate half beside it. You know, the, the, this is a very important space. So um, how that space would be utilised was, was going to be wordy, but in fact very little happened in terms of a big jamboree in the, uh, for 1916 in the centre of Belfast. But what has happened is that, you know, there are very good exhibitions in there. The, the museums have worked very hard at exhibitions as well that have told two sides of the story. Um, the City Hall invited us to come in and do the Halfway House on a couple of occasions in there as part of an Eastern 1916 discussion evening and a Psalm discussion evening. So I think that got handled um, uh, better than we, 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 might have we might have assumed that it did. So, But then the tectonic plates are shifting even as we speak. By the time I come out of this building, who knows what news will be breaking on Twitter, you know. And so that's an interesting one, is how we look back at Easter 1916 is probably going to continue to change in how the psalm story, um, you know, uh, possesses a meaning that is bound to continue to change if we're going to see the full consequences of Brexit. The other thing was, um, as a psalm historian, a First World War historian, I have been um, doing quite a lot of broadcasting, and that's been very interesting as well. So I was over with the BBC Northern Ireland team at the Ulster Tower. Um, and I did say that, I think, uh, you know, when questioned by Tara Mills, you know, the ceremony was over, um, 1st of July, the royals had come, people had shaken hands. And the question emerged, to my mind, what now? Okay, so 100 years have come and gone. What is, is, is there going to continue to be a sacred ground here for unionists. Um, but also in the light of Brexit and all of that, what's the future going to hold? The, um, is the kind of obedient courage that was manifested on, on the slopes of FIFA, is that, is, is that what's going to continue to be required of unionism? Or is there, is, does there have to be a more nimble, a uh, more thoughtful approach than simply just remembering the past um, events of the First World War, which are striking and powerful events. And I spent much of my life, you know, telling that story and insisting that it has to be told and told from the ground up, not from the top down. But what now? And of course, we're into a set of commemorations now. 1917-18, perhaps a bit of an abeyance in terms of volatile commemoration, though interesting events like the 1918 elections, um, the impact of 1970 in Russia on, on affairs here, um, the growing militancy of un the unions and, uh, you know, the, the, the by-election results that start to propel Sinn Féin to its power. But then when we get to 1919-1920, my big concern I think shared in this city is how do we deal with blood on the streets? You know, well, how do we do with the kind of things like the creation of the special constabulary in 1920? You know, the um, exercise of, of, of partition at so many different levels, legislative, you know, local government, education systems. And I'm a great believer that we can find ways to do all that. My, my feeling is that the psalm has grown in significance over the last lot of decades, in part because I think an older binding story uh, about the Glorious Revolution and King Billy and, uh, you know, the Battles of the Boyne and so on, that story is increasingly difficult to access as a, po as a piece of popular history. Um, you know, it's a man on a horse, uh, a, a monarch, from the upper echelon of society. You can see that in every plaza in Europe. And um, it's not like the Psalm story, because the Psalm story is to a large degree on the streets of Belfast about ordinary young men clad in khaki. Uh, 
um, going to war and you can identify with that. It's your street, it's your background and it's a working class story. So I think um, the Somme story has become very, very important but it's just simply the ability to access that space, uh, you know, uh, literally to fly out there as many do and, and, and be there in the geography of what happened but also, you know, the, the, the rise of individual genealogy through IT, very, very important as well. But it, it, what, one complication here is that, of course, nationalism has discovered this story as well. And in one sense, this can be benign because, for example, the Connaught Rangers group here in Belfast, which has worked on the story of nationalist soldiers in the First World War, has done superb work and has done a lot of liaison with Unionist uh, Centenary Committee fellas who are telling the story of, of young lads from loyalist backgrounds. But there is uh, something a little disquieting also about that because it means that the story of the First World War is getting more and more complicated, more complex. Um, some people have referred to what they call the greening of the First World War, which is a very interesting motif. And of course, um, th that... Can, that's a difficult one for, for unionism to take on board, but I think it's a good thing to take on board because if unionism is going to become more um, sophisticated and able to deal with uh, the 21st century world, it has to embrace more complicated narratives. You see, the story of the Somme can end up like the story of the Easter Rising sometimes was also in nationalism as a simplifying story. You know, uh, you know that's what we did. We fought on the streets of Dublin against ALO and 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 it's 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 simplifying in the way that the story of the Civil War later, for example, is certainly is, is very, very different. But also the simplifications of the Saw narrative uh, rule out the reality that in fact the relationship between Britain and Unionism has been a transactional and b at times antagonistic. You know? So um you know, th th what's important is then to, to di digress and diverse, you know, diversify um, the, the narrative a little more. And I think that that's going to be probably what happens as we look at some of these other centenaries as well. I, I would want to take that word commemoration and think about it um, as to what it means uh, or, you know, what, what are the various ways we can be commemorative. Um, you see, I think for me, some of the best stuff that has happened and continues to happen is debate and discussion and lectures and um, films being made, just the whole array of cultural stuff that's happening that never, I don't think, happened in the past to anything like the same degree. Um, so, for example, um, you know, in the failure this summer again, and my back from my background, you know, West Belfast was it was a frightening place. Um, uh, up to more recent times, I didn't go there. Um, at least, not to the falls and Republican areas. But now, for example, in the in the summer failure, there is a series of talks on the First World War. There's a series of talks on the on the rising, and. These are commemorative to a degree because you're remembering, you know, you're remembering sensibly, hopefully, and in a balanced way, in a fair way, and uh, with, with justice to f the facts as they, as they present themselves to us, um, the past. But it's done, first of all, somebody stands up, gives a presentation, and then there's open house for discussion, mediated discussion. That's commemorative, I think. Um... That's commemorative, but then there's the other stuff, obviously, you know, where wreaths are laid and, and the solemn remembrance, religious uh, services in some cases, uh, the placing of murals on walls. I think what this year has told us about Northern Ireland is that we've reached a, a much, much better place. Uh, there's no question about that. Much better place. Um, but with some way still to go, I think just in light of what lies ahead, uh, you know, in terms of what I mean by that is we're now looking at some 50th anniversaries for stuff to do with the Troubles. Now, we, you know, it's a bit like those Russian dolls, you know, 
you know, inside one one doll comes another, and then we'll eventually have, you know, are we going to keep on commemorating forever? You know, be interesting to write a play about that, wouldn't it? So, you know, there is that concern is, you know, not just about commemorating what and what it raises by way of the ghosts of the past, but also as a psyche, you know, uh, to be preoccupied all the time with what's gone before is something that always daunts a divided society. Um, and, and perhaps we, uh, we have to think hard about that one, you know. Uh, what's the role of, of history, popular history, historical narratives in the formulation of identity? Um, that's a very interesting, um, very interesting point. And perhaps, you know, that's something that the year 1916 brings, uh, brings to bear. Thank you.